uh, everyone. So uh, I hope you enjoy the beginning of the semester. So today is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, speaker of our colloquium, uh, Dr. Maxim uh, Panov. Uh, well, in Russian, it's Panov. Oh, Panov. Well, Panov. I learned it. <laughs> Panov. Uh, he's a senior research, uh, researcher at uh, Technology Innovation Institute, which is very nearby. And he has been a senior professor at um, Skol Skolkow. Skolkow. Uh, Institute of Science and Technology uh, since 2018. He actually has been uh, doing a lot of interesting work in Beijing approaches in machine learning, uh, uncertainty in communication, and graph analytics. At the same time, he was also involved in a very well known um, uh, library uh, of data analysis method for engineering application known as P7. So, uh, we know now that neural, net, neural networks are used almost everywhere, right? You can see neural networks. And sometimes they pretend they are competent about the prediction results, even in the, even in the out of distribution scenarios. So we really have to find a way to see whether we can, um, we can be sure, we can be certain about the prediction results by neural networks. Accordingly today, uh, Max will talk about uh, uncertainty, so whether neural networks can really estimate the uncertainty of the prediction So let's well, uh, welcome our uh, speaker, uh, Maxim Kanoff. Yes. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. It's a pleasure for me to talk here in France. <laughs> thanks to Professor Chan for invitation. And actually, uh, well, I'm very impressed of the number, about the number of people here, and uh, I hope that we can find uh, like common grounds for research. We are really like cross the road, so I took a taxi, it was two minutes taxi, and, <laughs> and in winter it will be 10 minutes walk, so we are very close. Technology Innovation Institute is really next door. Okay, so um, my topic today uh, is a bit general, so and uh, in fact the presentation inside uh, the actual content would be probably not that general. I will concentrate on some uh, specific topics uh, inside the uncertainty quantification. And uh, yeah, I hope you'll find it interesting. Also, uh, I should admit that, uh, um, that uh, this uh, event is called Colloquium. So I won't talk really much about my results. I, I will come to them at the end, but I will you introduce you and all those of you who are not familiar to some like common issues and approaches in this talk. So uh, what I will be talking about, I will be talking about the following, not a problem statement, but like general task. So I, not, I just not want to, I want not only to have a prediction by some machine learning model with some input, but I want to complement this prediction by some uncertainty measure. So something which measures uncertainty or confidence in, in predictions. So uh, say you have a classifier which classifies between cats and dogs, right? And we know that it outputs probabilities. So classifiers output probabilities. And for this cat, we have probability 0 0.9. For this dog, we have probabilities that it's dog plus 0, 0 0.8. However, uh, well, there are two questions. First one is whether these probabilities are good, like whether they mean something like a probability of success or probability of error on one hand. On the, on the other hand, there are many situations when these probabilities might be ill-defined. In a sense, I have this cat-dog mixture, right? And yeah, my model outputs me something because this object that's just an image, I put an image in the model, it predicts me something. But should it be 0 0.8, should it be 0 0.5, or better, it should be something like, I don't know, I'm I, I abstain from prediction as a new output of the model? That's, uh, that's a question. Uh, and if you are able to produce some uncertainty measure, like this probability or something else, then you can solve many different problems. For example, uh, you may target misclassification detection, right? You may try to predict that your model is, is likely to be wrong on a particular object. Or you may try to detect out of distribution data. I have cats and dogs, I put giraffe inside, and my model may say, no, 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 it's out of distribution. I'm not, I'm not 
qualified to say something about this one. I can do uh, detection of adversarial examples. I can do many other uh, tasks which generally call like rejection to predict. Also, I can consider some other tasks which, which can benefit from this uncertainty estimates. For example, the problem of active learning, it's usually designed through some uncertainty estimates or the problem of Bayesian optimization, which also benefits from uncertainty maps. So there are many different possible use cases. Uh, however, in this talk, I will mostly focus like on general algorithms and like problem statements. Okay, so let's first talk about uncertainty estimation and regression. And uh, um, so what do we want? We have the true function, which we don't know, we construct some approximation, some regression function, and uh, what we want on top in uncertainty estimation, we want some measure of uncertainty. For example, it can be an approximator of variance, right? And if you have this, so what we have? So you have a true function, unknown. We have some points which we measured. We construct our approximation. In some areas, it is good. In some areas, it's not very good. And uh, well, if we have this uncertainty estimates, a variance, we can construct a confidence interval. Of course, there are many ways to construct confidence interval. If I have a variance given or standard deviation, I can construct the one which based on normality assumption. Okay, so that's nice. Question is how to construct it. So what can we do? And first, uh, the first uh, definition which is useful is, uh, uh, is a confidence interval. So what do we have, just formally? So we have the data, say independent, identically distributed from some distribution. Then we have our dependency, right? So we have our labels as some unknown function of, uh, of covariance plus noise. And uh, we have some model. It can be different models. It can be linear regression. It can be nonlinear regression. It can be anything. And uh, the, the definition of the confidence uh, interval is as follows. So we define the confidence level alpha, and we want that my confidence interval, usually it is of this format, it's centered in your prediction, and then you have some lower and upper bound. So uh, like the general definition is a bit more general, but well, this is good, good enough. And we want that this confidence interval, it covers the true value of a function, with a probability not less than one minus half. So this is a standard definition from statistics. And uh, well, it's a nice, a nice object, uh, a nice object to have, which tells you a lot about uncertainty. So how can you construct this uh, confidence intervals? Uh, well, for some models, it's fairly easy to do. Uh, say you have linear regression. And for simplicity, I just have one dimensional linear regression. So, and uh, uh, on top of that, I assume that my errors are Gaussian. Like homoschedastic, meaning the same variance, uh, uh, normal noise. So what can I do? I can do standard least squares, and then my prediction under my estimates will be Gaussian, uh, Gaussian way. Why? Uh, because, uh, uh, least squares estimates, the standard one is a linear function of the data. Our data is Gaussian by assumption. Then my coefficient will be Gaussian as well. And then a linear function of coefficient will be again a Gaussian random variable. So what we have, we have that our prediction at a new point is a Gaussian random variable with a, uh, with a mean, which is a true mean, the one which comes from the function, and with some variance which is given by this expression. Okay, and uh, well, and then you can easily construct the confidence interval because for Gaussian, it's, it's, it's easy. So you know the distribution, you know variance, you know mean, you construct the confidence interval. So this C alpha over two is a quantile of, uh, of a normal distribution. Okay, so for Gaussian, it's easy. If I take multidimensional Gaussian, it will be also easy. Uh, However, uh, we probably want to extend that to more complex situations, right? And imagine that we have some nonlinear models. So here, theta, my parameters, 
and say it's neural network or something else, uh, not, not linear. Then if your parametric families uh, is sufficiently good and you have a large sample size, you can get uh, some help from the following result. That uh, uh, say you have uh, some estimate of your parameters, for example, maximum likelihood estimate, the center is a true function, and you normalize by certain value, which is a proxy of variance. And uh, this thing in the limit of a large sample size has a student distribution with certain degrees of freedom. So uh, this, uh, this type of result is called, of, is called usually delta method in statistics. And basically what you do to prove that, you do a Taylor expansion, first order Taylor expansion, and then you claim that the reminder terms are small and the sum assumptions, and, uh, and then you basically have sort of linearization in your large sample limit, which is not like super surprising, but uh, what helps. So what I can do with this result, I can construct the confidence interval based on this, um, uh, based on this asymptotic student distribution. So previously I had exact confidence interval because everything was Gaussian. Here already uh, the distribution only asymptotically close to the student one. And that's why this confidence interval will be asymptotic. So we won't have exact coverage, but in large sample limit, it will be good enough. So, well, seems like problem solved at least up to certain like approximation properties. However, this formula is very problematic. Uh, for example, this matrix is Jacobian and it's uh, somewhat hard to compute for the uh, large neural network with millions of parameters and with data sets of thousands and millions of points. So that's already uh, complicated. So it's computationally expensive. Also, this matrix might be very badly conditioned, so it's hard to invert, it's unstable, and so on and so forth. So it's like straightforward in theory. In practice, this estimate is not like, this, this um, confidence interval constructed in this way is not like super useful. And uh, in, our, in one of our work, yes, yeah, is here, I will send the presentation later on. Uh, we tried to scale it a bit. We used some matrix caching techniques to approximate it with a low ranking matrix, and it worked up to a, like a medium sized networks with like thousands of parameters and thousands of samples, something like that. But then it still was a, a bit expensive computationally, and also uh, the accuracy of these confidence intervals was not like super. It was okay, but. Uh, but not super. And uh, this approach is not like mainstream. I wanted to present it for you just for reference to understand how the classical results of statistics can be applied to neural networks. Okay. So in the remaining part of the talk, uh, I will be now talking about classification, not because regression is not interesting, just I was recently more focused on that. Okay. So in classification, what is nice, that everything is probabilistic by default. Of course, in regression, we always remember that least squares are inspired by Gaussian distribution uh, of errors and so on and so forth. However, if you do just penalized loss minimization, then you forget about probabilistic nature. Here, probabilities, here in classification, probabilities are always with us. And of course, we want to use them. So, well. I have binary classification, I have a probability of class one, or for example, and I can consider it a confidence in prediction of class one. If I have multi-class classification, I can consider the maximum probability of all the classes. So the one, for, so for the class for which we will predict, and this is a natural measure of confidence. For one minus this thing is natural measure of uncertainty. Well, that's nice to have. However, uh, right in 2017, uh, and even earlier, it was noticed that the, for modern neural networks, um, these probabilities are not good measures of confidence. Or oh, what we know about these probabilities? We know that our classification is based on these probabilities. And uh, because we know that modern classifiers are pretty accurate, we know that the ordering 
of objects by these probabilities from uncertain to certain is good. However, the, what appears that this, the values itself are not very meaningful for modern neural networks. What does it mean? Um, this plot is illustrative, but you need to understand it. So uh, what I do, I take some test data set and I uh, compute probabilities uh, for each object, this maximum probabilities, right? And uh, I split my objects in the test set in bins according to the values of predicted probabilities. So objects with probabilities from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, and so on. And then what I compute, I compute the accuracy, like the percentage of correctly classified objects inside the bin. Ideally, so it's uh, R max probabilities, right? Yeah, this is R max. So ideally, what I expect, what I want, I want the, the resulting bins, like this, this, this uh, bar plot, it follows the diagonal. So for objects with probability between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5, I want to have accuracy in this range somehow. However, what I obtain, I obtain like 0 0.3, probably a bit more than 0 0.3. And you see the same trend everywhere. So I take objects which predicted this probability from 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, but my probability is a bit less than 0. Points. Uh, my accuracy is a bit more, uh, a, a bit less than 60%. So what does it mean? It means that modern neural networks are overconfident. So they predict uh, the high probabilities, the high confidence, then the actual result, uh, actual accuracy will be. And uh, this is called the problem of calibration in machine learning. And uh, well, people notice that and they're thinking of how to fix it. So uh, yeah, also they will introduce some numerical measures of, uh, of uh, calibration. So basically how much uh, the resulting bar, bar plot deviates from the diagonal. And uh, well, if you check the proceedings of like major machine learning conferences, you will see that in every conference, at least until recently, there were always some papers on calibration. So people were improving, improving, doing better and better. But if you want some baseline method which works fairly well, uh, then I can tell you to look on temperature scaling. That's a very, very simple approach. So temperature scaling, what you do, you take your logics and divide them by a temperature parameter. So all of them by a single parameter. And then you take a validation set and try to tune. So you need the validation set, that's important. Uh, and you tune this parameter so that on the validation set, your result becomes calibrated. And then on the test set, you check it and you see, well, for example, this example, ResNet 110 on CIFAR 100, and they use temperature scaling and they obtain well, fairly good calibration. You see it's almost like four in the black. Uh, then after this 2017 paper, there were many methods which were more complicated, not like very many, but sufficiently many methods which were doing something more clever and so on. But um, well, that's already good. Uh, and here you may ask like, whether it's solved, like, yeah, you do calibration and you are done. Uh, and of course, you see I have many slides to go. Of course, the answer is no. Uh, one particular scenario where calibration doesn't help is so-called out of distribution detection. What I mean? Ah, it's a bit of a bit ugly picture, but I can explain. So imagine you have one dimensional um, feature, just one dimensional feature, and you have a classifier, and this is a probability prediction. So I have two classes. Here is probability like 0 0.7 something. Here is 0. Here is 1. But all my data was important, was between these two dashed gray lines. So all my training data was here. And then I ask you, let us, let us go to this point and predict here. My classifier is just a function. You can evaluate it at any point. And here it confidently says one. But let us think uh, like whether we actually have any information about this point. In fact, no. I mean, it's uh, on the distance from a data, which is comparable like the total size of a data set. So we are very far from a data set. 
And uh, we have no grounds to ensure that, uh, well, our extrapolation is meaningful here. And what, what does it mean? It means that uh, calibration doesn't make sense here. Here can be very different classes. This problem statement and classification from this, uh, for this object might, be, might make no sense. And uh, so it's fully separate problem of out of distribution detection. Probably not fully separate, but quite different. Okay? By the way, if you have questions, then please ask. Uh, and uh, in the remaining part of the talk, I will be mostly speaking about out of distribution detection, presenting some algorithms about out of distribution detection, and uh, well, you will see. So, uh, I introduced out of distribution detection informally uh, on the previous slide. Now I have to add a bit of formalism. So for that, I need to talk about probability distribution. So what I have in classification and regression and supervised learning in general, I have points X and Y coming from some probability distribution, right? Might be IAT points from this distribution. Then uh, I can split this distribution in the product of a marginal and the conditional distribution in two different ways. So I can consider the conditional probability of label given the covariate, usually called likelihood, times the uh, marginal distribution of covariates, or I may look on the uh, distribution of covariates for a particular label. Easy, uh, this object is very easy to understand for classification, right? For a given class, you just look on distribution of objects for this class, okay? And uh, this is, yeah, for classifications, this will be just a fraction of objects from different classes you have. Okay, so this is a standard object. And uh, how can we define an out of distribution then? So first of all, in distribution is the following situation. You have a training data, you have a distribution for them. And now you have a test data and distribution stays the same. Okay? And we say that our test data is out of distribution when our test distribution changes. Well, there are many examples of it. And uh, say, for example, you do object recognition from satellite images, right? And all your training data was from Emirates. Then you go to, I don't know, to Brazil. And if, instead of dessert, you have jungles, right? And uh, apparently everything changes about your data, the distribution of objects you have changes. Uh, but these changes, they can be of uh, different nature because uh, uh, different parts of this joint distribution may change. Uh, and I will briefly mention a few common types of uh, distribution. The first one is called coverage. So you have uh, your likelihood stays the same and distribution of your covariates changes. Uh, well, that's something that can be expected in many situations, and that's something uh, which needs to be uh, worked with. Then uh, you may have label shift. You had certain distribution of classes in your training data, and then distribution of classes changes uh, for the test data. It's slightly less obvious uh, why it should influence your classifier, but in fact, if you think, if you had some small class and uh, you know that for, uh, in training data, and then you know that many, many points from this class uh, will come during testing, that you should put borders far further from this class to be, sure, uh, to be on the safe side because uh, the class was small in training and, uh, and probably you didn't detect borders efficiently. And uh, uh, some like limiting situation uh, uh, when you have completely new classes coming during test. So it's called open set recognition when you can have new classes and you can think of, for example, face recognition with this respect. Okay. Uh, so that's about out of distribution detection and just a comment that uh, in fact, this problem uh, is very, uh, important for modern neural networks. For example, you see these pictures, and uh, for example, this one was classified as a king penguin with a very high confidence, like one. 
okay? This one was classified as a starfish. This one was classified as a fried car. And this one probably is the closest to the, like the object it was classified as a remote control. Okay, you can see something like buttons here, right? But uh, still it's not remote control. So, uh, and the probabilities were, were one. So we need to do something with that. Okay. Um, a bit more about uh, some definitions. Uh, usually when people start deeper into uncertainty, it's important to distinguish two types of uncertainty. Uh, sometimes people say model and data uncertainty. I prefer these terms, uh, which are almost interchangeable with model and data uncertainty. So there are two types I want to focus on. The first one is aleatoric uncertainty. This uncertainty, which is inherent in your data, like you have, uh, you have noisy labels, you have some data ambiguity, you have class overlap and so on. So that's a rhetoric uncertainty. It's inside of your data and you can't reduce it uh, with help of your model, right? Your, you, uh, this uncertainty doesn't depend on the size of the data you have. It's something in your data. The second type of uncertainty uh, is called epistemic uncertainty. It reflects the lack of the knowledge you have. So it's basically, uh, because your model was trained on the limited data set. And if you have more data, you can reduce, uh, you can reduce this uncertainty. And different types of uncertainty are important to measure separately because uh, for different downstream tasks, some of them might be more useful than others. For example, if you do active learning, you don't really care much about aleatoric uncertainty because in active learning, you want to improve your model as much as you can. And then you need epistemic uncertainty, which exactly measures, the, uh, measures whether your model is good or not at a particular point. However, if you want to look, for example, on misclassification detection, so whether you classify the particular object correctly or not, then you might be interested in total uncertainty in the sum of epistemic and aleatoric, because it basically defines the final probability of error. So, and the uh, illustration for the case of regression, say you have a linear dependency, but you observe it just in two regions and you don't observe uh, objects anywhere else. And here you see you have high variance of points and it means high aleatoric uncertainty. And here you have much lower variance and so it means much lower aleatoric uncertainty. And then, so, Areas where you don't have points, you may say that you have high epistemic uncertainty because again, you don't have data to predict that. Uh, another example, a, a bit of a different flavor. So uh, you have uh, some dependency and you see, so it's two dimensional, you have X and Y, and you see you have, you have, here you have two branches, right? And, uh, uh, and the other important point is that uh, to the left you have more points and to the right, you have less points, less density. So density of points is decreasing. And uh, uh, then you can plot different types of uncertainty. So here I have aleatoric uncertainty. So it has a minimum in the middle because they don't have any ambiguity. And it has maximum on the like, ends of the segment because you have ambiguity in the data. So you see it has a minimum and so on. Uh, then you can compute epistemic uncertainty uh, and it is this one. Uh, so you have, you are more certain to the left because you have more points here and you are less confident to the right because you have less points there. And then you can plot the sum of these two which will give, give you tokens. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, well, for out of distribution detection, uh, the problem I want to target further. Uh, so on one hand, out of distribution detection is a problem which is not connected with the model itself, right? Uh, because it's just a matter of distribution you have. However, um, if you think, it, and I will show it uh, mathematically later for, for some models, uh, that uh, epistemic uncertainty is directly related to out-to-distribution detection. At least what you can expect 
that the for out of distribution points, your epistemic uncertainty should be high. And I will illustrate it. Okay. Uh, I was a bit fast, probably questions. Any questions? Oh, everything is clear. Can I say epistemic uncertainty the uh, uncertainty on your parameter? Uh, well, uncertainty on parameters finally uh, influences the final epistemic uncertainty because epistemic uncertainty is, so my uncertainties will be uh, defined in the prediction space because it will be useful for me. But of course, the uncertainty in parameters, it influences the uncertainty in predictions. Okay. okay. I have a question. Yeah. What about uncertainty of the model you chose? Uh, well, well it uh, depends on how you define the uncertainty of model. Okay, so if you do the model that has five parameters versus one that has 10 million parameters. Clearly, we're going to have different uh, uncertainty. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, well, of course, uh, the uh, uncertainty, the, the epistemic uncertainty is the one uh, which measures, uh, measures uh, yeah, the lack of knowledge in your predictions. It will depend also on the model you have. So, yeah, that's, that's all related, of course, and, uh, well, Different models, depending on the size of the data, will have a different different level of uncertainty. But also, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, I, any more questions? Um, could you go back to the uncertainty model which you provided the data? data. Uh, oh, go back. Go back. Go back. What? This. This one. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh, why you didn't choose the, the last part of the data? Is this one? Yes. No, I, I, I was not choosing anything here. Just it happened that for some reason, my data set is between uh, minus 2.5 and 2.5, okay? For some reason, it was measured by someone in this way. Imagine you have, you are doing some engineering problem. You want to predict something which is one dimensional. Right, and you have a team who did some measurements on some device, right? And for some reason, they did measurements between minus 2.5 and 2.5. And then uh, you are a machine learning engineer, you constructed a model for them and give back to engineers. And they completely forget that uh, your model was trained from minus 2.5 and 2.5, and they try to predict in 4.5, okay? So here we come to problem because the model was not trained on this data. Of course, uh, I might, if I know in advance that I won't predict here and I have capabilities to measure here experimentally, I can have data from this segment. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So if data augmentation solves the epistemic uncertainty, uh, can you please... Uh, Spare a minute on this. How does it affect the calibration? Can you repeat again, please, a bit slower? Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, uh, if data augmentation solves the epistemic uncertainty, how does it affect the calibration? Uh, I think I didn't say that data augment. It depends on what you mean by data augmentation. I am just asking that if data augmentation solves the epistemic uncertainty, how does it affect the calibration? If data augmentation. Because, will, because you said that by giving more data, we can solve the epistemic uncertainty problem. So by augmenting the data, we can provide more samples, right? Yes. So how does it affect the calibration? Any study on this that you have come up with or like you can refer some papers or sort of things. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, yeah, indeed, if you have more data, then you will reduce the epistemic uncertainty. However, uh, if you need to have a data like in a clever way, because I mean, if you will have like, more data between minus 2.5 and 2.5, it won't help you really to reduce uncertainty much outside of the second. Uh, speaking about calibration, yeah, your model generally 
should be should be better but uh, if you have more uh, if you have more uh, more data but uh, like extremely accurate models like i don't know some modern large neural networks which achieve like 96 or 7 something uh, precision on image net uh, these models uh, are very badly calibrated and that's the state of that. So they have a lot of data. The models are extremely accurate, but they're very badly calibrated. So there is no direct relation. Okay. Fine. Interesting thing is that if you look back into like 90s, you'll find out that the models at that time, they were calibrated quite well. And, uh, uh, but it seems like the modern tricks for, neural, for training neural networks lead to some local optima which which are badly calibrated for some reason so no one i think knows exactly but uh, well it seems to be the case All right. uh, yes those okay that's the reason yeah just for sounds friend didn't touch Control. Okay, so can you use the sensitivity measure to correct the label? Like you detected that it's like out of distributional something, you know, wrong with the prediction. Can you, like, are there any techniques to correct the prediction, like using that uncertainty? Or... Uh, I mean, uh, the most straightforward way, probably not the one you're asking about, is to defer the decision to the next person. Say you are, you are doing medical imaging, you see that your prediction is uncertain and you ask a doctor to change. So, so that's the most uh, like straight thing. Is there any automatic way to do it? The other person. Uh, well, that depends on the scenario. Like generally I would say like no. Uh, however, there are many particular scenarios. For example, you construct lightweight model and you measure uncertainty for it. And then you ask some very complex Strong model to do but right. like so whenever I do out of distribution detection, then like the next thing is gonna you know talk to some human, right? That, that to talk to the human, the label, talk or... to more powerful model, or just like do nothing. Uh, okay, coming back. Yeah, it's good that we have many questions. Now I will briefly talk about some like general methods more heuristic ones, which are used for uncertainty estimation. And uh, the most popular approach to, uh, to estimate epistemic uncertainty in the literature is so-called uncertainty estimation by disagreement. So what you have, you have ensemble of models. Imagine you just train, train five or 10 neural networks. And uh, what you do, you just somehow measure the disagreement between their predictions. And if all of them agree at some point, you say, okay, this point is easy. I have a low epistemic uncertainty here. But if at some point the prediction disagrees significantly, then you say that, well, here you have a high uncertainty. So it can be directly the variance of your, like average variance of your logic, of your predicted probabilities, or there are some measures like BALT, which are based on mutual information. So there are different variants. And you are not limited here to just ensembling. Uh, you may use, for example, Bayesian neural network here or dropout. And I will talk about dropout later. So again, you have many models and you use them, uh, you, you use them uh, to measure the disagreement between their predictions. What's important here uh, is uh, this, that you should but what you should know is that in many applications, this method is state of the art. So uh, you just train many models uh, from different random initialization. You even don't care about begging or something like that, which is used to ensemble, say, decision trees or something. Yeah, just neural networks, uh, you know, the loss function is uh, like have many local optima. You train models from different random initializations, they converge to different local optima, the models are different, you have a disagreement. And what, uh, what appears uh, to be in practice that it works pretty well. So you measure the disagreement between them and it's, it's somewhat good measure of uncertainty. Uh, 
course, a completely no theory behind, uh, but it works. And uh, a lot of research in the literature uh, was uh, devoted to uh, speeding up uh, these computations. Because, well, if you have one large neural network like Transformer or something for ImageNet, you probably don't want to have five or ten. Even one is, is already a lot. And uh, what people were trying to do, they were trying to find an alternative. They have some links here. And uh, one approach which was extremely popular, it was popularized by Irene Gall. He's currently an associate professor in Oxford. And his uh, PhD thesis, um, well, this is a reference to a paper, but PhD thesis was around the same time. Uh, he suggested the following idea. Well, I think everyone knows what is dropout, right? In this university. <laughs> OK. Uh, so uh, the idea was very simple. Uh, usually, you use dropout only on the training stage, right? And on the test stage, uh, on, on inference stage, you just switch it off, you scale. Uh, scales and neurons, and that's it. And uh, the idea of your it was very simple. Let's switch on dropout on an inference stage. So essentially, you get many models for each dropout mask sampled, and then you can compute uh, the discrepancy, standard deviation, or whatever measure you want. So uh, you save time on training, you save space on storage of the model. But of course, uh, the prediction time multiplies. So for some applications, you make it better. For some applications which care about prediction time, you're still bad, but well, it's already bad. Uh, I, I don't provide any graphs, but usually this approach works much worse than, than the standard and some. So the quality is uh, not that good. Still, many people use it because it's very easy. You don't need to train many models. You very often have dropout in your model already, so you just use it like out of the box. So that's why it's popular, and this paper has, I don't know, 5,000 citations or something. Uh, OK. Uh, however, this approach and many other approaches still have severe problems with out of distribution. Why? Uh, and uh, here I have an, a picture. So what I have, I have NIST data set. It was uh, uh, projected to two-dimensional latent space by autoencoder. So my data, so my numbers as these colored dots, right? And then what I do, I compute, uh, uh, I compute the uncertainty measure for um, uh, for different uh, points in this latent space. And what appears, so the 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 lighter the color, the more uncertain I am. And I go very far from my data here, here, here. And I see that my model, I said the light, I actually don't remember exactly, but what's important is that you have very dark and very light, very far from your data. And it means that your model might be very certain in predictions, very far from your data set. So if you reconstruct this object from here, uh, by autoencoder, that will be some uh, some random set of pixels, but all my ensemble agrees on some predictions. So out of distribution problem is not solved by assembling, unfortunately, and we still, oh, fortunately, because we still have some work to do. Okay. And uh, now we come to the final part of my talk. I actually don't know uh, what's about timing, so. Still have, uh... Minutes. Oh, even 30 minutes. Very good. Then I have enough time to like to talk about this in detail. Okay. Uh, so uh, recently, like two years ago, people started to look on the certain family of methods uh, which don't look on assembling at all. And usually people say about deterministic model uncertainty. The idea is extremely simple. It's a general idea. Uh, and it can be described as follows. So you have your initial objects, you have a neural network, and what you do, you look on the embeddings produced by this model in some latent space, like last layer, top and ultimate layer, so somewhere closer to them. And uh, uh, then how can you do uncertainty estimation, uh, or in particular, out of distribution detection? Very simply, 
If you look on this embedded space, that's already some vector space, and you have a measure of distance there. So what you do, you just, you take a test point, and if it's not very far, whatever it means from a training point, then you say we are in distribution. If it's far, you say that you're out of distribution. So the idea is very simple. <coughs> of course, uh, immediately you can uh, like think of some possible uh, situations when it doesn't work. Because your neural network is very powerful model and it can uh, distort your space very significantly. So it might be that some points are somehow close in initial space, but very far in embedding space and vice versa. There might be some points which are very far in initial space, but because neural network is very powerful function, very, which can give you very complex dependencies, these points may become very close in embedding space. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will talk about it on next slide. But generally, what I can say is that the approach is based on this idea often work very well. So for example, I have a very simple data set, two moon data set. And if you will try to, uh, to train ensemble of models on this data, they all will, will be agreeing with each other here and here. So there will be like, uh, uh, there will be, uh, they, they will say that all of them are very confident in prediction here and here, so very far from training data. And disagreement will be only between, uh, between uh, uh, the classes. However, uh, models based on the idea I just told you, but you look on the distances in embedding space, uh, it might work very well. So like here, you see, we are certain only near classes, so yellow means certain, and you are uncertain everywhere else. It's not like a silver bullet, but on these two examples, uh, it, it works pretty well. Okay. Quick question here. Yeah. So in this case, you can even achieve the same thing by making use of the original space. Yeah, correct, of course. Yeah, so did they give instructions as to how to learn the embeddings? That will be next slide. <laughs> so Indeed, a uh, very good comment, thank you. So of course, for this data, you can do the same in original space. So uh, you can do just measure distances or use the kernel model or something. So no, no problem with that. But uh, these plots, uh, I trained, not, not me, it, it's taken from a paper, they trained the neural network. So it was simple, like two or three layer neural networks, they trained and used it. And uh, for general case, uh, what you need, you need to do something with neural networks so that they work well in this respect. And what people do, people uh, try to regularize the neural networks a bit. So ideally, if you think you have initial space and you have the objects which are nearby or far away in the initial space, and, you, and if you want to keep uh, the same notion near or far away in the embedded space, you want your function, which, which is doing your mapping, uh, to be not very, like, uh, not very complex. And one possibility is that you make your function be Lipschitz, right? So you have a, uh, what, what does it mean be Lipschitz? So it's usual Lipschitz. So uh, that your, the distance between your embeddings is bounded by constant times the distance between input points, but also you want the same from below. Is a different constant apparently, and uh, and uh, that that ensures you that points uh, which were far away in the embedded space would be also far away uh, in the points which were far away in initial space will be far away in embedded space. Okay, okay. that's of course nice to have, but uh, how you ensure that for neural networks? <laughs> that's very complicated. Uh, because neural network like a uh, very complex object. And probably if you strictly ensure this, uh, you will have a bad classifier. So, yeah. so what people do, uh, people use a very uh, simple trick. They consider ResNet networks. And uh, for ResNet network, for each layer, they apply so-called spectral normalization. So what you do on each step of optimization, uh, you compute the uh, spectral norm of your coefficient matrix for each layer, 
and then uh, normalize it so that the spectral normal is smaller than something. For example, smaller than one half. And then for ResNet layer in total, uh, you will have a B Lipschitz property, like for like for usual uh, for usual activation functions, like you know, sigmoid or uh, or or real, and it ensures you that each layer becomes B Lipschitz. Say if you bound the spectral norm by one half, then you will have three half here and one half here. However, it doesn't ensure, of course, for the whole network because in the worst case, this constant will multiply layer to layer, and uh, it might be arbitrarily bad. So this can become very small, this can become very large. However, in terms of uh, practice, it works pretty well. What does it mean? On the next slide, I will show you that the results, uh, that it really helps to achieve good results. And uh, also, in terms of neural network training, this spectral normalization doesn't make things work much worse. So you have a convergence a bit slower, but usually you achieve same or almost same accuracy. So you train a bit longer, but generally it works okay. Uh, so why is this normalization is important? Because as I said, neural network can distort your space very significantly. And if you apply this approach, like looking on distances in embedded space uh, without this normalization, you have obtained something like that. So the initial space was uh, perturbed so much that uh, in the embedded space, you lose the distance. So you see, uh, it thinks that this point is very close to this point. You see, we are very certain. What does it mean? It means that these two points we are mapped almost to the same point in an embedding space. However, if, you have, if I apply the spectral normalization, then I obtain something like this. So you see the distance is preserved. Of course, again, it's still an example, uh, but well, uh, if you apply that to, uh, to large neural networks, and I will have some experiments with big ResNets later, you will see that the quality improves. I'm not sure I have it on the slides, but we'll have it in the paper. So the, you, you improve your results always uh, when you use it. Okay. Uh, questions here? Uh, how does that special normalization will, I mean, you drop all the weights and you can ensure the Lipschitz inequality? Uh, you have your, uh, so you have a layer of a network, you yes. have a linear matrix there, you have a matrix. Yes. Uh, and uh, you compute the spectral norm and then divide matrix by something times the spectral norm, like two times spectral norm, and the resulting mapping will have a spectral norm like one half, for example, if you divide by two times the spectral norm. So you do your usual, your favorite method to do gradient descent, you do step. And after the step, you additionally divide all your matrices by respective constants which you compute. So you have additional time to compute these things, and generally convergence a bit slows down, but it works. And, and you ensure that for each layer is believed for ResNet network. Yeah, we can I can clarify later if the question remains. Okay. So now I come to the last part of my talk, and it's actually our well relatively recent work uh, where we, we wanted to formalize uh, uh, the problem of, out of uncertainty estimation a bit more and we will have a bit of statistics here. Uh, so the previous works like in this one it was more in machine learning style I would say so what they did uh, yeah. I should have a skip this slide so what they did in the final layer of their network, uh, they, I, they instead of you having soft max, they considered kind of a radial basis functions activation. So they learn the center for each class and the weight matrix of each class. And finally, they have these things as uh, like as the probabilities of classes. Okay, to get probabilities, you need to normalize one more time, but generally you have this thing. And if you are embedding your object is far from the centroid, this probability will be small. If you far from all the centroids, then you are out of distribution. So that's the idea. Uh, 
but uh, we wanted in our work, we were inspired by this work, uh, it's again group of Yiling Gao, and uh, we wanted to do something a bit more grounded and a bit more statistical way. Uh, so what do we have? First of all, uh, I consider, uh, first of all, what I need, I need the notion of a bias optimal classifier. So imagine I have binary classification, I can generalize it to multi-class. So I have binary classification and uh, uh, bias optimal classifier is the one which minimizes the probability of error, right? So you have an error that your prediction at a given point is not equal to true label and you want to minimize this probability. Uh, and uh, bias classifier, it uh, has an explicit formula which is very simple. So if your conditional probability of observing label one given X is greater than one half, then it's class one, if it's smaller than one half, it's class zero. Okay. However, in practice, you don't know this classifier. You have some your, your favorite approximator. My favorite will be kernel one, as you will see next. Uh, and uh, uh, I can compute the risk of prediction for my given classifier, g head of x. Okay. So uh, at, 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 at a given point. So this value is nice. So it's not the average probability of error over all the data set. I, can, I look at the particular point because it doesn't depend on covariance. So in the sense that you, you can consider the covariance sheet. So it doesn't depend on test distribution of x. So this object is nice for my purpose because it's, if it's large at a given point, then I can say that, uh, well, I have high epistemic uncertainty. High uncertainty in J, not epistemic. Then what I can do, I can decompose this risk in two parts. In a very simple way, I add and subtract the risk of a bias classifier. So here R star, R star is a risk of a bias classifier. And R tilde is the difference between the risk of a bias classifier, of my classifier and the bias classifier. Okay? It is usually called excess risk in statistics. So how much my classifier is worse than the bias one. I didn't do anything fancy. I added this thing and subtracted it. Just convenient for me to decompose. Okay. Now, uh, I want to do one assumption. Uh, and this assumption is that uh, my, uh, I want my classifier, g hat, to, be, to have the same form as the bias classifier had before. What I mean by the same form? I assume that I have an estimator of conditional probability, uh, of, of label probability, okay? And my classifier gives one if this estimate is greater than one half and gives zero otherwise. Then I can, uh, I can use a very simple formula from uh, like statistical learning theory books. She says the following, uh, excess risk can be bounded by two times the difference between conditional, pro uh, con uh, conditional probabilities you use. That's a very nice inequality to have and to know. So two times the difference between conditional probabilities. Okay. Okay, you can do that. Uh, the question is how can it help? Uh, what I do, I, I have my risk and now I upper bound it by the sum of a bias risk and, uh, and by this guy. Uh, well, now I need to do something with it. I need to estimate this thing. I need to estimate this thing. This thing I don't know, it's a bias risk. This thing at the head I know. This thing at it's a true one I don't know. Okay, first the question to the audience, what to do with this guy? How can we approximate uh, uh, and probably someone knows the formula for binary classification. Any ideas? See a constant for a given data set. Uh, data set is not involved here. That's uh, the function of a probability distribution you have. 
So probability distribution gives you, so you define probability distribution and it gives you the optimal classifier. An optimal classifier, uh, where is it? An optimal, sorry, an optimal classifier gives you a risk. So it's not, it, it doesn't depend on the data. It's something which is from, it comes from population. So I think distribution is a thing. Sorry? Yeah. My thing, my way of thinking is I think distribution is a kind of data set. <laughs> uh, well, what we need, of course, we need to estimate it on based on the data set. And uh, basically what you can use, okay, I didn't notice, but the formula is here. So in fact, for binary classification, the formula is uh, you just take the minimum of conditional probability and one minus conditional probability. And then I have eta hat given as I assumed, and I just plug in it here, okay? So that's just standard plug-in estimating statistic. Okay, still I need to do something with this guy. And that's a bit more interesting. Now, let us forget about neural networks at all for a couple of minutes, okay? And uh, what I will do, I will do something. It's already one hour, it's a reminder. Okay, you know, but uh, the, Good. Two Go slides ahead. with formulas and then few pictures and the other. <laughs> okay, uh, so I, I will do something strange, which you probably won't expect to do. I will do a kernel classification based on the Darai Watson formula. So you know uh, the Darai Watson regression. Everything knows what is it? So what regression? Non-parametric regression. The Darai Watson estimator. No. Okay, uh, so uh, Nadarai Watson estimator, yeah, well, I don't know, Hasty and Tipsharani can help you, of course, uh, but uh, uh, Nadarai Watson estimator, so you have a usual kernel estimates of density, kernel density estimate, KD, and in a similar fashion, you can do, you can uh, derive a regression estimator. And uh, this um, uh, regression estimator is very simple. What it does, uh, imagine you, you have here the, uh, the values of a regression function, yi. Forget for, for a minute about this notation. Then what uh, the Dry Watson estimator is doing, it considers a kernel function and it weights this observation according to this formula. And this estimator has very nice properties. It's minimax optimal in terms of statistics, you can't do better, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I here applied to estimate not the regression function, but to estimate the conditional label probabilities. So what I do, I, I, do, I take all my objects which belong to a particular class, and then I estimate my conditional label probability according to this formula based on the kernel function. Okay? Well, strange choice. Why I use it? I use it because I have a nice asymptotic result that if my sample is large enough, uh, then the difference between eta hat and eta, so my kernel estimate and the true conditional probability converges uh, in distribution to the normal distribution uh, with zero mean under certain condition, conditions and with this variance. And this variance has a very nice form. Forget about this thing, it's constant. It's integral of a cap. Forget about this thing, as I know. Look on the central part. In the denominator, I have a, a marginal distribution of covariance, which means that if I'm far from the training data, then this thing will be small and my variance will explode. And in the numerator, I have a a variance of my labels. So in case of binary classifications, it's just variance of Bernoulli, okay? So what I'm going to do next, I will use this thing to approximate this term, okay? How I do it? I consider the expectation of my upper bound for my loss function. Oh, not loss function, but for, for the risk, okay? And it will have two parts, this one, this I estimate by plugin, and this one, 
And this way, an estimate using the normality assumption, not assumption, but I can call it assumption. So I use this normality result. And finally, I obtain the following formula for the total uncertainty. This part plus tau of x, and tau of x, this is square root of this guy. And I can estimate these guys, again, using kernel estimates or something like that. Okay. So what I did, I derived some uncertainty estimate for kernel, uh, for kernel classification. But I was talking about neural networks. So what should I do now? Your suggestions. It would be very nice, but very complicated. <laughs> but completely in the flavor of the approach we discussed before. So what we were looking before, uh, what was the idea of the approach with a single deterministic method? What we were looking at eventually? Narrow input objects, narrow networks, then embeddings. embeddings. What should I do? I should apply kernel classi classifier to embeddings. So that's what I will do in experiments. Um, yeah, one picture, look on the right one. They're similar, but look on the right one. Uh, so what I did in, in the experimental part, I considered different image data sets. And then in the paper, we also have some uh, transformer based text classification. Uh, but uh, here, I. Uh, I have examples about images. And what I do, I took MNIST data set and I took SVHN data set, put it into grayscale. I took 10,000 objects from rotated MNIST from test data and 10,000 objects from SVHN. I merge them all together and now I want to separate them because SV my, my neural network was trained on MNIST. Now I want to separate them. And uh, my ideal, ideal uh, curve will be as follows. So what I plot, I plot the fraction of a switch on objects within first objects with lowest uncertainty, okay? And ideally, I should have only missed objects until 10,000, and then I have a linear increase up to the end. And uh, now what I do, I sort objects according different uh, methods. And my method is called new, non-parametric uncertainty quantification. And you see that many methods completely fail. So like, this is almost worst case, right? And uh, so the random, the random is this diagonal, so, and they behave similar. But my method works like almost ideally. There are some other methods in the literature which works also very good and similar to this one, but at least some simple methods completely fail here and uh, this method works well. Then uh, what we did, we tested the method on ImageNet. So uh, we considered the two data sets for out of distribution detection. One of, the, one of them is called uh, ImageNet R, oh, sorry, and the second one is called ImageNet O. So this one is called ImageNet R, and it contains some artistic uh, like images, some pictures, paintings, and so on, comic style, uh, which belong to the same classes as, as the initial image. And uh, what, what we looked, we looked on some objects with like from a lower percentile of uncertainty, from the medium percentile, percentile of uncertainty, of high uncertainty, as predicted by our method. And what you see is that for low uncertainty, which we have something which is almost photorealistic, even some photos, right? Then we have something already more artistic, and with high uncertainty, we have something which looks very differently from ImageNet. Okay? So it's like not a proof, but like gives you some intuition that probably method works. And then we tested it on uh, out of distribution detection task. So what you do, you take test data set from, uh, for ImageNet, and you take this ImageNet R or ImageNet O data set, and you use uncertainty measure as a classifier between two, okay? And you compute area on the curve. And here I have very many methods, like just use probabilities, use entropy, you use 
test time of mutation, you do some unsampling, and here are some methods which do, uh, uh, which use a single model. So these two are from the group of Yarin Gal. This is the one which what you've seen previously, it's uh, ICML 2020. This one is not published yet. SNGP is a very popular paper by Google on using Gaussian process uh, to estimate uncertainty on top of neural network. Very popular paper, but very hard to make this method working, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and finally, at the end is our method, and that's, well, you see there is certain gap, okay? So our method works better, and, uh, and so on. We also have uh, a bit of theory in the paper. If you are interested, I can send you a link later on. And, uh, well, here is, we have a preprint online, my posters, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we are waiting for a new result. <laughs> okay. Uh, wrong way. So, summary. Uh, well, uncertainty quantification and uncertainty estimation is very important. And it's important to remember that there are these different sources of uncertainty and you uh, can, should use them wisely. Then, out of distribution detection is uh, quite challenging tasks, task. Uh, you can solve it, but still a lot of work to make it better and better. And uh, you should think about many aspects. You should think about the algorithm for certainty estimation itself, but also you should be careful with respect to what model you have. If your model is very strange, it will be very strange to do, uh, it, will, it will be very hard to do uncertainty estimation. So, and we try to do some a bit more principled approach to that uh, and to help us a bit to improve. Okay. Thank you for your attention. My email is here. If you have questions, you can write me, and we have some code. Thank you very much for this. We have time for some quick questions. We are running out of time. So, I have more questions. Uh, I, uh, I have a question that, uh, like, uh, during the last uh, slides, or uh, last slides, you show the experiments on on like uh, images. Yeah. So my question is that uh, I noticed that you, you are using like a uh, bi Lipschitz font. So, right? You use what? A uh, bi Lipschitz. Uh, I, I, yeah, I used this regularization when training the network. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question is that like uh, uh, in, in image, like uh, like you, you bound, uh, you also do the uh, bound on the original space, but uh, right? Uh, like you, you, you bond the, the no no I, I eventually you know this belief sheets I can't ensure it I I do it just layer by layer but eventual mapping can be very far from so it can be shifted no just I mean when you have a composition of two mappings ellipses constant in the worst case they multiply oh. so that's why I can't say anything definite for a network with fifty layers so it does not necessarily mean that it also bounded on the original space well. In principle, if I achieve that in original space and somehow obtain the classifier which is still good, it would be great. But I first doubt that the Billipschitz classifier will be good. And second, I have no way to achieve it. So uh, what I do, I do it layer by layer. And what I observe experimentally is that it helps. So if I, if I don't have a, a table, but uh, if I compare the result, it already works for ImageNet without any regularization with standard training. But if you add this regularization, you get few percent improvement. Uh, well, my, actually, my, my point is that I, I would like to How do you that define the distance between two images? Yeah, yeah, that's my point. You know, the difference between two images is... Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so uh, the distance between two images is, of course, uh, uh, like... Well, you need to find a way to define it, okay? So this Belipschitz is an abstract property. What I do, I just regularize my, my matrices I have. So I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about any particular distance in the image. In, in, yeah, yeah, because in an image, if you just uh, shift a little bit, but the L2 norm, uh, L2 distance may be uh, dramatically large, but actually, like uh, in, in semantic locally, it's not very, very far away. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's true, of course. But still, like, from general perspective of regularization, if you do this, uh, say, spectral regularization, you 
apparently uh, limit the space of uh, uh, of mappings you are considering, and uh, it, it regularizes. Thank you. Maybe you can take the last question. I think we have many, we had many questions. Yes, or, okay, I have a quick uh, follow-up question. So um, I can see we, you can quantify the uncertainty this way, right? By making use of non-primary uh, kernel density and measures. Do you think this approach can detect, say, adversarial, adversarial examples for which you just choose, right? It just makes the business as small as possible while you have different outcomes. Uh, it's an interesting question, and uh, we had some experiments on adversarial attacks detection, and uh, in that task, this approach uh, didn't, uh, like, make a breakthrough, I would say. But actually, the problem of detection of adversarial attacks with uncertainty estimate is very complex, because uh, even uh, for different, uh, even for different methods, uh, different adversarial attacks, I mean, different types of attacks. The resulting uh, objects, which are all adversarial and successful, might be very different. For example, uh, you can have some simple attack, and it can overshoot the boundary between classes very significantly. And then the methods based on aleatoric uncertainty, so just maximum probability of entropy, they won't work. However, you may take very sophisticated method, which just crosses the boundary a bit and stops. And then surprisingly, your aleatoric uncertainties, the simplest method possible, will, you, will work very well. Because the adversarial attack was too clever in some sense, and it stopped on the boundary between classes where you have a maximum value. So that's, that's complicated. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Okay?